set to go again. Chris, I say next to you tonight. Set and background and action. Welcome to Cinema and the Psyche. I've got a bit of a background party going on across the field here, but um, hopefully that won't be a problem. Anyway, this is uh, going to be about visual language, but only partially, really, because I think what I'm not going to get into is... Um, the use of the camera. So that would be lenses, focal lengths, movement, stuff like that, which is very important in the realm of visual language. Um, as usual, cinema is highly complex, like, I guess, any art form. If you want to really master it, you probably need a good decade of intense pursuit, study, work, um, producing of work. Producing of work as a filmmaker is a bit more difficult because the tools of cinema to really have the machine of cinema up and running requires a crew and tools that, although they're cheaper than they used to be, they're still expensive. So, but that's not what this is about. So visual language in the sense that what you put in the frame. And so I wanted to cover, I wanted to maybe see if I could go a little bit further than I did in a previous podcast. I forget, maybe it was ideas or a previous podcast. But I wanted to you know, explore the idea of what you put in the frame and what it means and why, uh, you know, everything that is visible um, conveys something. Now, of course, the things that are the main subject in a frame are conveying, you know, the strongest, let's say the most conscious messages, but in fact, everything in the frame is conveying to your uh, psyche, your mind, um, important information, and so I think I mentioned in a previous podcast where there's the internal object, Carl Jung's internal object, so in that sense, we have external phenomena like grass, trees, water, bodies of water, sky, weather patterns, stuff like this, and when we see these things, when we experience, when we perceive these things, they trigger the internal, they, tr in, they trigger an internal version of reality that has associations. So a lot of associations are coming from our youth, um, but a lot of associations are coming uh, from other places. What we've been conditioned, not only by, you know, life itself, by, you know, being born and the experiences that we go through attaching themselves to different phenomena, but um, conditioning over time from other people. So one of the things that I find interesting and quite complex. For some reason, I'm always drawn to the complex. I don't know, probably some neurosis to always feel confused or something. Uh, the complexity, are these meanings being generated, you know, n naturally within, or are they being generated 
through social conditioning, conditioning from other people, what, for example, what internal conclusions or what internal um, decisions are, you know, nat- a, a natural um, reaction to external phenomenon and what have been artificially conditioned and need not be that way. And then, of course, you have different internal conclusions in regards to external perceptions that change through cultures. I mean, in a sense, I've heard this spoken about comedy, that comedy doesn't, sometimes doesn't travel well because culturally, you know, what is funny in America uh, may fall flat in other places. Now, of course... America is kind of wiping out all cultures, um, and therefore, <laughs> the more that happens, the more homogenous will be all these various mm, interpretations, and that's a real pity. So let's hope that doesn't happen, but cultures all over the world are embracing American culture like it's, you know, the best thing. And uh, they have no idea that, you know, the, the levels of happiness in America or, or health or all these things, they, they don't realize the consequences of this, you know, unbridled pursuit of facade, you know, but they'll take it anyway. Anyway, that's a different topic. Um, what I do find interesting and for the filmmaker I think is relevant For the audience, it could be interesting to understand how you perceive things, but basically, which objects, which internal conclusions, rather, are universal and which change across cultures? So, generally, I've only ever heard this spoken about in terms of types of stories, like I just said, comedy. But this actually applies to the entire material world, the hard material stuff that we put in the frame. Um, We interpret everything largely to mean something, even if that's happening unconsciously. And it also triggers an emotional response. And... I believe it's controlling, largely it's controlling that emotional response that is the work of the filmmaker. So not even exactly what ideas are triggered, what specific thoughts are triggered, but more what emotions are triggered. So then that becomes more complex, like I said, because different things will trigger different emotions in different people. So as the filmmaker, I think because I'm interested in you know, mass media or large audiences, then of course I want to learn how to use the symbols that are trigger universal ideas and universal emotions for being able to touch the widest audiences around the world. And although I wanted to read or quote the Elia Kazan uh, speech, it actually wasn't at the Directors Guild. They've just released a good copy of it online, a PDF. It was actually addressed to a university. Um, I forget which one. But in there he said all of the... what a director needs to know... And he went through so many, well, basically everything, uh, dance, art, movements, encounter movements, um, theater, stage design, um, you know, weather patterns, uh, the cities, uh, country, um, landscape, you know, to, and what I get from this is that everything is triggering uh, 
emotions. Now, of course, so you see it clearly with weather that often at just the, you know, sometimes at the worst, at the worst possible point in the film, you'll have a great downpour thunderstorm that can facilitate the electricity going out. But not only that, just the nature of rain or storms coming at emotionally just the right time for what you're trying to do in the story. So it's not only weather, but everything. Desert will convey certain, I don't know, isolation or loneliness or, or jungle can be oppressive or... You know, of course, you see it way too much. Uh, I, you can just almost expect it nowadays that at the three-quarter point of a movie, they're going to be in a confined underground or warehouse with metal piping everywhere for the bullets to ricochet off, and they'll be more and more confined. And, uh, you know, to uh, bring the walls in on your protagonist, etc. So, obviously, you know, there are many working filmmakers who understand the nature of this very well, but, you know, maybe it's not something that's conveyed very often or in very many places that your environment and all of the things in it should be used... Um, or can be used and can be seen and perceived in a way based on your understanding of how they affect people emotionally. So in that sense, everything is actually a symbol for uh, what happens internally. So then you have symbols and the meaning that people get from those symbols. But another area that I find very interesting is how can you change the meaning that people relate to various symbols over time? And so that would come... Again, you know, I talked briefly about marketing and commercials in a previous podcast. And in a sense, that's what they're doing there. Although they're maybe not changing uh, what you associate to a certain... Maybe, yeah, maybe their initial uh, agenda is actually just to associate, to, you know, associate enjoyment, associate pleasure to their product. So that is the nature of marketing. But you can also... I think what's important is to be able to adjust uh, previous associations to new associations because I think there is a lot of symbols um, that have been mm, hijacked over time so I won't mm, I can go that direction too far but the fact is is that many I mean Actually, the, the swastika is a perfect example that actually that's a holy symbol coming from uh, ancient India and the Vedic literature, and it's used as a symbol of protection. Um, I think a symbol of purity, so unfortunately I don't have the meaning of it in, you know, in my mind at this moment, but I know it's a, an auspicious religious symbol all over India, and it was, you know, for thousands of years. And yet, due to its use um, in Germany in World War II, everybody's association to that symbol is completely off. So that symbol's been hijacked, and the meaning that's been associated with, that's been implanted in everyone's mind is um, incorrect. And, I mean, this has happened with a lot of 
symbols, a lot of ancient um, religious and powerful symbols have been hijacked in this way. And so one of my interests really is to be able to detach associations from symbols and implant new ones, you know, and, and cinema is the realm of symbolism and uh, thoughts and emotions attached to those symbols. I mean, it is a visual medium, and words, in fact, are the weakest way of conveying information in cinema. So although we have had sync sound added to the art form, it doesn't mean that, you know, now talking is, you know, so important. In fact, it's, like I said, it's one of the weakest ways to convey information. And I guess that comes from the fact that other visual uh, forms of communication in cinema are so powerful that, you know, we're, you know, using words to convey it is kind of embarrassingly insignificant simply because of how powerful cinema is otherwise. And then, of course, I'll go ahead and add a little take on camera, you know, because my feeling is camera movement is today. I feel like the way people are texting with um, acronyms and single letters or they're spelling what as W-U-T, I mean, this is getting disturbing, you know. So I feel like the same thing is actually happening with the way cameras are used in movies today. Often you feel like you're hearing from people who simply don't know how to speak the language. So I'm not like the expert on such matters. I consider myself a director, which means what I intend on every project is to get a cinematographer who, you know, feels the same way about visual language. And basically that is that the camera is reflecting, reflective of our, how we perceive things in real life. So moving close to the subject and the frame is just like moving close to a subject in real life. And so my feeling is that camera movement really should be reflective of the actual physical counterpart, you know, in reality. And it should be related to the state of mind of either your protagonist or whichever point of view you're deciding to take at any particular moment, the movement of the camera or the angle of the camera or the focal length of the camera, the depth of field, all needs to be reflective of the state of mind of the point of view that you've chosen. One of the things that I find most annoying these days is the use of handheld, a handheld camera. Not Steadicam. Steadicam is very, very interesting and has many uses. In my opinion, handheld camera has very few uses. And it generally is for when there is um, basically like physical danger or when there is enough tension in the air to justify the tension that you feel from these little jerky movements. Even if it's minor jerky movements, that's what they are. And really, it should only be used in those circumstances where there is, you know, threat of physical danger or aggression. Otherwise, it's a misuse of the language. 
you know, when you're calm and relaxed and, for example, eating breakfast, you're, unless you're on cocaine or something, or you're up from the night before because you're wasted or something, you're not having frantic movements going on in your head. Your eyes aren't darting around, right? Maybe you're tired and therefore a steady cam has a nice flowing motion, but you're certainly not jerking your perception around here and there. And therefore, you know, there's it shouldn't be it shouldn't be used if you want to be able to convey successfully what you're trying to convey. One of my favorite uses has to come from David Lean film. What is it called? Brief Encounter. Brief Encounter is um, visually, from in terms of the camera, well, I mean, it's David Lean, but it's so solid. The frames are just so solid. And then at the moment where our leading lady, I forget her name, she rushes out because she's ready to jump in front of a train. As she's considering that move, the camera for the first time, you've been with this movie for over an hour of solid frames. And then as she is having this thought of suicide, the camera pushes in and tilts sideways, diagonally. And because of the proper use of visual language, it is very powerful. And, you know, another problem is, you know, the overuse of close-ups. You know, we simply don't spend our lives in close-up, right? So, the close, you know, it's like anything, you build up a tolerance. So, anything that's overused will, its effect will weaken. You know, and a close-up is one of your greatest tools in the cinema. You know, being close up to somebody. It should be reflective of some of the most, you know, vibrant in, in your face um, kind of emotions. But if you have close-ups all the time, then it's no longer powerful. And basically you're not using the visual language the way it could be. Basically, the close-up doesn't become powerful anymore, and neither the wide reflects anything useful either. So, you know, I'm not an academic. Uh, I've watched films and studied and made some, and all that I think comes from, you know, my limited experience. I'm not a, a university-studied, you know, film student. But um, I prefer it that way, and my conclusions are mine, so whatever. But um, in Vertigo, for example, watching how Hitchcock treats uh, his scenes, very classic, very uh, firm shooting, except on the one line or the one moment in the scene that he wants to, you know, signify. And that one moment or one line will be with a different framing that is out of the norm. And it gives it a very strong power. The power of that one shot then becomes very powerful because he's not using it repeatedly. You're, and it's the same thing you know, I don't know, maybe in music it's like the chorus of a song. You know, if, if the whole song is just the chorus repeated, what's the point? But you love the chorus, unfortunately, because it only comes around three times, you know, in, a, in your song. But it's sweet. And so I think to keep the power of visual language, we need to do the same. So, I didn't intend to speak about camera, but I wanted to make the podcast, you know, roughly the same length as the others. And it's 
relevant. And um, so I'll quit there for now. I've got some ideas for uh, the upcoming podcasts, and I look forward to bringing those together. So thanks for joining me. This is Cinema in the Psyche, cinemainthepsyche.com. My email is matt, M-A-T-T, at cinemainthepsyche.com. I'd love to hear some criticisms. If you have questions or comments, write um, a review on iTunes or any of that stuff would be cool. The main thing is, though, that I hope you find it inspiring to hear about um, hopefully deeper aspects of the cinematic form rather than just repetitive three-act structure and, you know, screenplay formatting and, you know, how awesome the red camera is. As a filmmaker and as an audience member, cinema is an art form that is mega. It's epic. And we're hardly touching it. In my opinion, if you want to begin to see greater depth in cinema, then you should be going back to the 50s, 40s, 50s, and having a look at some of the great films from those decades. Because this is a time when visual language was very accomplished. Um, What was being conveyed was worth conveying and we had less corporate and, well, I mean, there's always going to be political agendas in there, but we had some really powerful filmmaking going on at that time. I don't see it right now. In fact, I think we are necessarily on the verge of the next wave after you know, the Sundance years of the 90s. You know, Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino, Steven Soderbergh, and that wave of independent filmmaking from the 90s. I don't think we've seen anything since then. I think we're ready for it. I'm not discounting that there aren't good filmmakers or films being made, but as an an industry, as a medium, we are ready for the next wave and so this podcast is a little contribution to that really I guess it's to encourage me more in the things I'm thinking about so I can hopefully make better movies and inspire others along the way I hope it I hope it does that okay thanks so much until next time